conductor. It is well recognized that insulated tools and equipment are essential for doing energized work. It is just as essential for using personal protective grounds when doing de-energized work. Personal protective grounds provide the primary protection in the event a circuit under repair inadvertently becomes energized. In this program, we will identify the function of personal protective grounds, describe the basic design requirements for personal protective grounds, and demonstrate techniques for installing and removing personal protective grounds. When maintenance or other type of work is performed on or near de-energized equipment, the only way to assure that the equipment will remain de-energized is to short circuit and ground the system. In industrial and commercial electrical systems, grounding of current carrying components can be difficult and sometimes impossible to do. The primary purpose of personal protective grounding is to prevent accidental death or injury to workers from electric shock by minimizing the magnitude and duration of the hazard. Static charges can build up on an isolated circuit or equipment due to airflow, friction, dry conditions, and dust. The direct current voltage adds to any alternating current voltage that may be present. A single ground connection will immediately drain off this charge and bring the conductor to ground potential. Discharges associated with static charges are relatively small and last a fraction of a second. People are more likely to be injured from the reaction to the shock than by the shock itself. Capacitively coupled voltages exist whenever two or more conductive surfaces are separated by insulation. If one or more of these surfaces is energized, a 60 hertz voltage will be induced between the surfaces. An example of this might be a substation bus conductor and earth. The substation acts as the bus conductor's conductive surface, and the air acts as the insulator. Steady-state charging currents will flow due to this capacitate effect. Electromagnetically coupled voltages exist when a de-energized, non-grounded conductor closely parallels an energized conductor. When this occurs, static, capacitively coupled, and electromagnetically coupled voltages all exist together in varying magnitudes on each phase conductor. Grounding one end of the de-energized conductor discharges the static and capacitively coupled voltages. The electromagnetically induced voltage, however, cannot be completely discharged even if grounds are placed on both ends. The reason why this is so is because the energized conductor acts as the primary winding of a transformer, and the de-energized conductor acts as the secondary winding, creating a transformer with a one-to-one -one ratio. A low value of mutual inductance is created. Possibility of operating the wrong breaker. Operating the wrong breaker affects normal plant operations in unexpected ways. Equipment may stop, then restart without warning. Results can range from minor inconveniences to injury or fatalities. If the wrong circuit breaker is operated, report it immediately. Do not re-energize the breaker. Always open rack-in and rack-out circuit breaker switches with doors closed. Whenever possible, operate breakers from remote control switches. If remote control switches are not available, stand to one side and turn your face away from the breaker when opening or closing the breaker. The next piece of electrical equipment that carries possible hazards is the fuse. Fuses are generally safe and reliable circuit protective devices when they are properly rated for the application. A fuse has three ratings that must be considered for proper operation. The voltage rating, the ampere rating, and interrupting rating. The voltage rating of a fuse must be at least equal to the applied circuit voltage. It can be higher but never lower than the circuit voltage. Ampere rating. Every fuse has a continuous current rating. When this rating is exceeded due to overload or because the fuse was not rated properly, the fuse will blow and clear the circuit. Underrating the fuse size usually does not create a hazard to personnel, 
but does cause unwanted delays in the operation of the equipment. The interrupting rating of a fuse is often overlooked. Interrupting ratings are generally printed in small print on the side of a fuse and must be properly applied. A misapplied fuse with an incorrect interrupting rating could explode. Analyzing electrical hazards is essential if safe work procedures and policies are to be developed. If the protection method is inadequate, employees may be injured or worse yet, killed. If the protection method is overly stringent, employees may circumvent the protective measures resulting in injury or death. Accurate electrical hazard assessment, along with operating conditions that expose employees to these hazards, will go a long way to preventing workplace injuries and fatalities. An arc typically occurs when a short circuit has been introduced into an electrical power system. The intensity of the arc is directly proportional to the maximum current that the power system can deliver to that point. In other words, the available short circuit at a given location is one of the determining factors affecting the magnitude of the arc hazard. The simplest form of short circuit analysis is point-to-point -point analysis. Point-to-point -point analysis is used to calculate fault current at various locations within a radial electrical system. To understand short circuit current, Consider the analogy between an electrical system and a reservoir. In this example, the reservoir is the utility system from which all electrical power is drawn. Under normal conditions, electrical energy is drawn in a controlled fashion until it reaches its utilization level. When a short circuit occurs in the power system, it is the equivalent to the dam breaking at the reservoir. Downstream devices may reduce the flow, but ultimately nothing will stop the torrent that rushes towards the end-use devices. This unconstrained flow, if not interrupted, will damage or destroy downstream equipment. It also contributes to the electrical arc hazard. A radial system consists of one direct path between the electrical source and the load or equipment. Note that in this example, a large distribution transformer is connected to a main switchboard 25 feet away. Downstream from the switchboard is a standard industrial motor. The local utility provides the short circuit current, while the transformer, cables, and switchboard fuses limit the amount of short circuit reaching the motor. Companies with established electrical safety programs tend to create greater awareness and self-discipline for their employees who perform work on or near exposed electrical conductors and circuit parts. In this, our tenth and final segment of our series on electrical safety for industrial facilities, we will turn our focus on electrical safety related work practices as it applies to employee training and qualification, approach distances to live parts, personal and other protective equipment, and specific safety-related equipment and work practices. Employers are required to provide training to all employees who face a risk of electrical hazards that have not been reduced to a safe level. In other words, they must be trained to understand the specific hazards associated with electrical energy and possible injury. The type of training they receive can be either classroom, using programs such as this, or on the job. Personal protective clothing and equipment must be provided and used when work is performed in areas where there are electrical hazards. The equipment must be maintained in a safe and reliable condition and visually inspected before each use. When flame-resistant clothing is worn, it must cover all ignitable clothing and allow for movement and visibility. Proper head and eye protection must be worn to prevent injury from electric arcs, flashes, or from flying debris resulting from an electrical explosion. Hand and arm protection must be worn when there is a risk of injury from electric shock and burns due to contact with live parts. To protect from step and touch potential, insulated footwear must be worn when hazards from these types of sources exist. Many companies have a list of common work tasks respective to its hazard and risk category that describe the types of personal protective equipment required for the job. 
If you have any questions regarding what type of personal protective equipment is required, talk to your supervisor. Another important aspect associated with electrical safety related work practices deals with the use of specific safety related equipment. Test instruments and equipment fall into this category. Only qualified personnel should perform testing work on or near live parts operating at 50 volts or more. Test instruments and equipment and all associated test leads, cables, power cords, probes and connectors must be visually inspected for external defects and damage before the equipment is used. If damage or defect is detected, the device must be taken out of service. Load rated switches and circuit breakers or other devices specifically designed as disconnecting means